Good morning and uh, welcome to Healing XJWS at blogtalkradio.com. I am your host, Augusta Anastasio. Nate Beckman couldn't make it this morning. He's got to go ahead and earn a little extra money and uh, work this morning. But, uh, you know, uh, prayers is with Nate and uh, for a speedy return to the show. And uh, this morning uh, we have a special guest. I just want to let the callers know if you want to uh, ask questions or uh Want to share something uh, on on the air? Uh, call the one three four seven nine three four zero three seven nine and press the one button so that I can see that you're calling. You who wants to be heard? Uh, I believe I hope that this is Roland at two four eight. Roland, is that you on the air? Yes, indeed it is. Okay, that's uh, my brother Roland. Roland McKenzie, <laughs> how are you doing? Is former- Hey, I'm doing great. Roland McKenzie is a former Adventist. I've known Roland as long as I've been an ex-Jehovah Witness, that long, and I've never spoken to Roland until today. Uh, we both <laughs> we've both been on we we both met on an email discussion list by a man who's uh, very responsible for me uh, leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses and a great mentor of mine, Roy Howdy Shell, and. Um, so uh, that's how me and Roland went, met on a refuge email list. This is when, actually, before Internet really, really got big and everyone used to really dialogue by emails instead of blogs and Facebook and everything else. Ain't that right, Roland? That's very correct, yes. <laughs> so uh, Roland is my, my brother from another mother. You're African-American, right, bro? Uh, last time I checked, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, and what's 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 really interesting about Roland is not only is he a former Adventist, but you currently go to a Messianic congregation, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah, so he he's uh, a Messianic Jew, and uh, and uh, and I'll tell well, you one thing. More, actually, more accurately, I guess it would be more like a Messianic Gentile. <laughs> oh yeah, well, Messianic Gentile who goes to a Messianic Jewish congregation, but I really would recommend everyone to at least go to one Messianic Seder. If you ever get a chance to, you have to go to a Messianic Seder and experience Christ through Jewish eyes. And um, uh, just go to um, Chosen People Ministries or uh, Jews for Jesus and, and look up for local Messianic congregations in your area, and I'm sure there's one around. But it, until you go to a Messianic Seder, uh, it's it's just a a great way of seeing Jesus through Jewish eyes. So um, I um, I think we have a caller who wants to eight one five. Hello, eight one five. Uh, you wanted uh, to say something or share something? No, is this? Uh, uh, can you hear me, Gus? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Hi, Gus. Hey, this is Dale Beckman. This is. Oh, okay. this is excuse me, Nathan's okay. brother. I, I I came in late, but I'm here enjoying the show. And in case of something cra- catastrophic happens, I might be able to pick the pieces up. But I think you're doing just fine. Okay, great, great. Well, I'll just I'll just keep you on, I'll keep you on the air so that you know if you want to um, um, dip in, you know. Uh, All right, so great. we have we have uh, actually Nate's brother who's going to uh, help host and co-host the show with us. So. Um, Roland, um, I have a question for you. Were you raised an Adventist? How did you become a Seventh Day Adventist? Well, I was indeed uh, raised in it. I was basically born into it. Oh, you was born into it. So you you have uh, parents and grandparents, or just your parents were converted to Seventh Day Adventism? I would say mainly my parents. And uh, okay, so. Your parents, I mean, what was it? They, uh, the Adventists, well, now they do a lot of uh, evangelism. Um, they even do door to door evangelism. But um, I don't, uh, is that something that they've always practiced? I think it's something they have practiced for quite a long time, yes. I mean, even going back to the beginning. Um, just, just for informational purposes. I know everybody's wondering, well, why do we have an Adventist on the air uh, or a former Adventist on the air? Well, uh, I just thought it would be really cool if we go into Seventh-day Adventism because 
uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are actually rooted in Adventism, and here we are at this time of year celebrating the Advent of our Lord. The, the word Advent actually means coming, and so um, uh, I just thought it was really appropriate that uh, at this point that since we've learned so much about Jehovah's Witnesses that we go into uh, some of the the background of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and I know Charles Taze Russell was uh, very much influenced by Adventism. Uh, Nelson Barber, George Storrs, George Stetson, um, uh, uh, all of these people were Adventists. And so uh, a major influence in the Jehovah's Witnesses and their teachings was Seventh-day Adventism. And um, so uh, Seventh-day Adventism, uh, so you were raised as an Adventist, um, at what point in your life did you, was it that, you know, something, did you got baptized at what age? I would say I was 11. Uh, 11 so you was out, so you were young, you know, you was young and, uh, your parents, are they, are they still Adventists? Or are they still believing Adventists? Uh, yes, very much so. And so you have you have siblings? Any siblings? I have I do have one brother, and um, as far as I know, he is still an Adventist as well. Wow, wow! So is he older, or are you the younger, or the older of the two? I'm the oldest of the two. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, when, uh, give me a familiarity when when you exit Adventism. Is it kind of like the Jehovah's Witnesses? Is there a really strict shunning policy, or? Um, you still have a pretty good relationship with your relatives. Well, I would say that uh, Seventh-day Adventism is not quite the same as Jehovah's Witnesses in terms of shunning. Uh, right. I mean, there there are certainly instances where that has occurred, but I, that's not an overall church policy. Right, right. I, I think uh, generally speaking that, I mean, it may certainly put a strain on the relationship, but there is still, you know, the line of communication still stays open. Now, um, I, I've I've come across just a few Adventists. I, I don't really come off come across them um, too often. Um, my latest encounters with Adventists has really been mostly on Facebook, um, and um, and and there seems to be within Adventism, kind of like even with the Witnesses, you have like faithful. Russellite Jehovah Witnesses who still follow Russell's teachings and that are still considered themselves Bible students. And then you have now Jehovah's Witnesses, which really is a more of a byproduct of Joseph Rutherford rather than Charles Taze Russell, the founder. Um, uh, I've come across a group of Adventists that are more traditionalists, more according to Ellen White's early teachings and um, uh so would you say that there was there there was a I guess a paradigm shift in Adventism somewhat, but yet still there remains a lot of the you know, just like with the Jehovah's Witnesses, there's still a lot of those rust light errors still inculcated in the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not sure if there's as much of a paradigm shift uh because you know, from my view of Adventist history and of course, evidence I have encountered uh, during my time in that religion, as well as afterwards, uh, there is this strong adherence to Ellen White's uh, teachings, her writings, and right. you know, out, outsiders may not notice that right away because uh, evidence are very careful, generally speaking, not to really uh, mention her writings or mention her at all until they have somebody within their religion, you know, once they're kind of indoctrinated into their teachings. You know, um, Adventists are a lot more stronger, um, actually, than Jehovah's Witnesses in some respects as far as their, you know, following their follower. Because um, uh, they admit, Ellen G. White, I think according to the Seventh-day Adventists, if you go on their major website, and if you go, I think, under their uh, faith statement, they say that Ellen G. White is an inspired prophetess. Um, 
And that would mean that everything that she has said as far as teaching is infallible. Am I correct in that assumption? Well, they would basically say her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth. And right. while they say within that same, you know, within their fundamental belief that, uh, you know, that the Bible is the final authority on, you know, basically faith and morals and experience, uh, what really ends up happening in a practical way is that um, evidence will follow the Bible at, as long as it does not contradict Ellen White's writings. And so if anything happens to come up and there's a doctrinal uh, question about it, many in many instances, uh, quotation or, you know, some passage from Ellen White will settle the matter. And uh, she cannot be, in essence, contradicted in any way. So if, you're, if you happen to be a uh, pastor or some other church uh, teacher or employee, uh, you cannot disagree with her on anything. You just can't because if you do, it could cost you your job. Wow. So, uh, so I mean, that's basically it seems like the same premise with the witnesses. They, they'll actually say that they believe in the inspired word of God, um, but, of course, what they really mean by that is that they mean uh, their interpretation of the inspired word of God cannot be disagreed with. So so um, the, there's no room for free thinking as far as what you believe, what the Bible says. Um, you have to abide by what the, in this case, the governing body teaches until they change their teaching or their mind on, on a subject matter. So it, it's I guess that's similar to with Ellen White, um, except for the fact is that the governing body continues to exist in Ellen G. White. Um, she's passed away, so uh, there's no ever-changing teachings that she's continuing to have. I know that, that and that's part part of the problem is the Adventist Church's view of her because they cling to her so much that and they kind of view her in a practical sense. Her writing is is infallible. That uh, they're basically stuck. You know, if they Unfortunately, they they admit to they decide to follow the scriptures on let's say for example uh, just the gospel, you know, right? Or the you know the state of the dead for example, or whatever you know key issue that they really teach on. Well, if they end up abandoning, if they come out and say in essence that well she was wrong on this or that. The entire denomination would fall apart because it's so much, so much of it's based on her infallibility. They may not want to admit that, but that's the case. I mean, if they say, for example, that the 18, 1844 investigative judgment doctrine that they came up with, you know, in the aftermath of the Millerite movement, uh, was wrong, and of course it is wrong, but they can't admit that because that's one of their quote unquote pillar doctrines. Uh, the whole structure falls apart. And, right. and so, so they can't they can't progress beyond what she stated. Exactly. So they're stuck with her, and wow. uh, that's and so that's so in, even in recent years, you know, you've had recent church presidents that have in essence placed her writings on equal footing with the with the Bible. You know, they would say, for example, that the Bible is considered special revelation. But then they'll place her writings on the equal footing. You know, also call it special revelation. So there has been this just polarization around her that hasn't that has just grown stronger over the years. And I, I think this is especially in light of the fact that the if you've ever heard of the Worldwide Church of God, right, with, uh, mm-hmm. Herbert Armstrong, they went the opposite direction. They decided to drop Herbert Armstrong's teachings, the their founder of their religion. Who, by the way, was influenced by Seventh Day Adventism as well. Right. Um, yeah. But they, as a denomination, decided to follow the scriptures, and and uh, they've become a gospel preaching uh, church now, which is wonderful. And they went through a lot of pain to do so because you know I think one third of their uh, the people in the denomination ended up splitting away. But I think the Lord has really blessed them because they decided. 
those who remained decided to stick with the truth of the scriptures and move forward with that and abandon the false teachings that they um, previously held. And I certainly would like to see that occur with Seventh-day Adventism, to just stick to the scriptures and um, abandon this sort of infallible view of uh, Ellen White's in her writings that is really holding the church back from really believing the gospel. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I I will say this. Um, other groups like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, at least, um, even though they do highly value their founders, and uh, and I would say the Mormons and Adventists more so than the Jehovah's Witnesses, who pretty much have left Russell in the you know, <laughs> pretty much left them behind. Just use them as a. Um, as a symbol of this is where he took us to this point and we advanced from there. Um, but, um, you know, at least um, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons have a doctrine that allows for uh, leadership to pass the baton and therefore there's a possibility as long as they have a new leadership that there could be reform, and um, that would probably be a little more difficult because for the Adventists because they have stuck with her as the inspired prophetess, and, and she's gone. She's not, you know, so now they're stuck with her writings, and they cannot remove themselves from her unless they develop some type of um, pass the baton uh leadership type of thing um and and they they don't have that i i do want to discuss a little bit and and you brought it up um uh what a, a lot of our listeners probably don't know is that you know that some of our listeners who really are familiar with the Jehovah's witnesses or ex Jehovah's witnesses know that the Jehovah's witnesses have a history of false prophecy um and um and this pursuing of trying to figure out when Jesus is going to return. And and that really was the motivation for uh Charles Taze Russell through Adventist circles. Um the Adventists or Ellen G. White were a follower of a man named William Miller. And I want you to relate to us the significance of eighteen forty three and eighteen forty four in Adventist history? Well, uh, William Miller, of course, was a Baptist a minister who, in the early 1840s, uh, in, you know, through his study of the Bible, uh, he had come to the conclusion that Jesus was going to return. I think first it was in 1843. And, um, you know, he used a variety of calculations to come up with. Uh, a date in 1843 as to his coming and I think it was probably later in the year maybe towards the fall mm -hmm. and uh, of course that was incorrect and uh, no matter how many times people other churches mention that you know Jesus' own word that no one knows the day or the hour when he's returning that did not deter him <laughs> from uh you know, speculating on his return and coming up with these calculations to set a date. Well, of course, the date came and went, and then so going into 1844, uh, I believe around March or so, they had come up with another date and thinking that, okay, if I just adjust my calculations a little bit, um, this is the actual date. It is almost like Carol Camping today. You know, this year right. you've heard about that. You know, you come up with one date, and that date passes, and nothing happens, and so you come up with another date. Well, that's there's nothing new about that because William Miller had done that as well. Well, of course, the date, earlier date in 1844 passed, and then the final date was in October 22nd of 1844. And so at this point, everyone was really, you know, within you know that movement, they were really saying, okay, this has to be it. And, of course, 
a lot of the people that joined this movement left the churches that they were going to to be part of this movement, and they were, of course, um, really excited about the second coming of Jesus, the prospect of him coming back, and they were just, of course, very um, enthusiastic about spreading that message. Well, of course, uh, October 22nd came and uh, went, you know, and uh, nothing happened, and there's what they call in Adventist history the Great Disappointment, you know, because there were just so many that were eagerly waiting, waiting the uh, return of the second return of Jesus. That um, you know, many just gave up their faith or um, went back to the churches they went to before. But then you had a small core of uh, people who refused to even admit they they were really wrong on on the date, and so they became what we know today as Seventh Day Adventists. Now, William Miller himself never became a Seventh Day Adventist. He finally repented of his date setting, and I believe he went back to being a Baptist minister. And uh, and you know, some years later, he died. But he never became a follower of Ellen White or the early, other early Adventists. He sort of learned his lesson and and faded in the background. But with the Adventist church coming together, they decided early on, Ellen White, her husband, Uriah Smith, and others had come to the conclusion that, well, we were still right about the date. Of course, they weren't right about that either, but that's what their view was. We were just wrong about the event. And see, the date they were looking for was the Day of Atonement in 1844. Now, they said it was October 22nd, but if you talk to some of the more Orthodox Jews back at that time, you know, if you check the calendar, the Day of Atonement was actually September 23rd that year. So they were a month or so off. So they didn't even get the date right. But, you know, they, you know, they decided that, okay, well, you know, we're correct about the, the date, and so something must have happened in heaven. And so instead of Jesus coming back to earth, uh, he actually, they came up with this doctrine where he moved from one compartment in the heavenly sanctuary to another one. And that formed what later came to be known as the uh, you know, shut door doctrine and then, of course, later on the investigative judgment doctrine, which still exists to this day. Yeah, so, yeah, that's why I wanted um I wanted you to get to um um what is exactly the investigative judgment doctrine? I, I know and, and I'll tell you one thing, the, the Adventists are kind of a bit uh candid about 1844. They they actually call it the great disappointment. Am I I, I think, right? Is, am I right about that? Yes, they do call it that. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, at least they're very candid about um it being a disappointment, but um, then they, but the, yet at the same time, it's it's kind of like cognitive dissonance. They call it a disappointment, but then they say, well, something did happen, but we just didn't see it, which is what the witnesses did about 1914. You know, and, and they, 1874 and other dates. Right. Yeah. Something happened. We just it was invisible, and and that's also what um what uh uh um. Uh, uh, um, camping did also in May, you know. Yeah, you know, that's, he admitted, that's, that's correct. Yeah, he, he also admitted that he said that something did happen. We just uh, it wasn't what we expected, so it was something else. You know, the judgment began in I think May thirty first. Uh, but um, but I, I thank goodness for camping being completely repentant now about his false prophecy. So, uh, you know. Uh, that's that's you know that doesn't happen often that uh, uh, one of these false prophets absolutely repents uh, completely of their errors. But uh, so yeah, um, what uh, what is exactly the investigative judgment doctrine? And and I know this is uh, within Adventist circles. This is uh, has been a uh, controversial subject. I think there was a whole book written uh, on it. Um, uh, by a former Adventist professor, I think. Uh, which one was? 
Uh, well, he wrote a book. I think he actually endorsed um, uh, Ray Franz's book. I think his name is Desmond something. Oh, uh, Desmond Ford. Yeah, Desmond Ford, yeah. Actually, yeah. that's an inter- interesting story in itself. I mean, he had written, the book was nearly a 1,000 pages uh, many years ago, I think back in the early 80s. Because yeah, at so, that time, so was Ray's book. <laughs> yeah. Ray's book was about a thousand pages too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what had happened? Well, that that whole thing actually had come as a result of uh, Desmond Ford was an Australian uh, Adventist theologian who um, was I guess trying to focus more on the grace of God in his teaching, and uh, so. To keep an eye on him, they decided to bring him from Australia to the United States, and uh, they gave him a teaching, you know, professorship at um, another Adventist college in California. And of course, while he was in the United States, they wanted him to discuss his views a little bit more, especially regarding the investigative judgment doctrine. And the idea, the investigative judgment, in essence, is that well, in 1844. Jesus moved from one compartment in the heavenly sanctuary to another one to start this uh, judgment of all the dead. So in other words, he would be going through the books and searching to see who was in essence worthy of eternal life or not. And um, as he's going through the books, he decides, well, I will apply my atoning you know, sacrifice to this person or not to that person, depending on how they live their lives. Now, at some point, he will uh, get to, you know, according to the view, he will get to the living, and but see, you don't know when that will occur. And so, as Adventists, many of us lived under this dread that, you know, if Jesus gets to my name in heaven and in the judgment, and I'm not living my life the way I should be, or, you know, I haven't overcome all my sins, then I'm going to be rejected and, and not go to heaven. You know, mm-hmm. I'll lose out in eternal life. And so, so, in so, so that, basically, you don't know when he's going to start judging the living. So he could be start if he starts judging you and you're 20 years old, <laughs> then that's it for you. You know, anything after 21, you yeah, any changes you make after 21 can't cut it. Well, that's just the that's just the problem, you know. Once he gets to your name, and you, at that instant, that point in your life, if you're not living the way you should be, then you're done. Wow. So, uh, do you just drop dead? I guess when he makes your judgment when you're while you're alive, or is it? No, no, that, no. You um, don't necessarily you don't necessarily drop dead. You just don't go to heaven when you die. Oh, so so if if, if once he starts. Getting on the on the roll call for the living, at whatever age they are, uh, if they haven't made any significant changes at that point, then the rest of their life, whenever they die, they have already been judged. Exactly. Wow. And and how so, do they come up with that scripturally? <laughs> well, that's that that's the problem. That's the issue Desmond Ford dealt with. Uh, he had actually proven in, in this long, lengthy, it's almost like a dissertation, but the church, the, the SA church leadership decided to let him uh, write a book, but to air his views and, you know, basically discuss it. Of course, what they didn't tell him is that uh, this was going to turn into a trial of him. And so when they, um, you know, had a conference to discuss his views, uh, they had a lot of, sure, they had theologians there, but they had a lot of church administrators there as well, and they were the ones who, in the end, decided that, well, Dr. Ford, if you don't come back to the church teaching on this, we know that you've written this this book, you know, proving, in essence, that, you know, this is what the Bible teaches, and it's not consistent with what Ellen White taught on the, on the topic, but if you don't basically uh, come back to Ellen White's uh, view on this, then you're out of a job, and that's exactly what they did to him. They defrocked him and and um, cast him out, so to speak, hmm. at least from his teaching position. And now they will say that, well, we didn't take his membership away from the Adventist Church, which is technically true, but 
you know, if you've been a professor in in the church, a very prominent one, and you're um, kind of vilified worldwide as being this heretic within the church, it's a little difficult to hang around right. after being shamed that way. And, and it's so a little difficult up, to earn a living, too. I'm sorry? It's probably a little difficult to earn a living, especially since you were a, a prof within Adventist circles. It's like now you have to try to get a, uh, a, I guess, teaching position outside of Adventist circles. Exactly. And so, he, you know, the Lord has blessed him, and he's managed to do that. And I, I, I think he's still alive. He's just very old now, of course, but I think he's right. still alive. He started his own gospel outreach ministry. Uh, some years ago, after he had left the Adventist Church, but yes, you're uh, right. It is very difficult. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Mark Martin. He's another um, much younger fellow, uh, but uh-huh. he's a pastor out in Arizona, I believe. And uh, he he has a very uh, fascinating story to tell as well, and uh, you know about his experience, you know, coming in as a and have been his pastor. And then I'll tell you who, about... who I have met. I met, um, I don't know if you know him, but I met him, and I've got to get him on the program. His name is Dale Ratsliff, I think. Yeah, I don't, yes, I'm yeah, familiar I, with him. Yeah, so I, I met him a couple of years ago. Actually, I met him, in, I think, in 2003. Um, I was speaking at a Calvary Chapel church in Washington State, and uh, it was a conference. It was called the X Conference, and so we had we had uh, ex Mormons, we had ex Jehovah Witness, we had ex Adventists, and we had ex Evolutionists, and so um, every, every type of X. And they and we all did, um, you know, we all had, did. I guess uh, we did workshops and we did all kinds of things, and it was a, a great weekend where we all. Um, spoke on our various subjects, and so that's where I met Dale, and he he primarily concentrated on Seven Day Adventist Sabbatarianism, but um yeah and, and I and yeah I got two of his books now on it. Yeah, I have several of his books as well. In fact, uh, Dale Ratzlaff and both both Dale Ratzlaff and Mark Martin have been uh, very instrumental in me coming out of Adventism, really. Uh, right. Yeah. So now, were, uh, yeah, that's where I want to get to your your story. Um, because you were raised Adventist. At, at what age did, uh, and what were the events that caused you to start wondering? You know, hmm, there's something up with the 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 church that I go to, the the religion I'm in. I would say when I was in college, I, when I was in college, I was working on a theology degree actually. So I okay. was actually uh, training possibly to be, a, you know, some you know, church or denomination worker, you know, especially, you know, as a Bible teacher or as a pastor. And while I was there, I worked in the library. And uh, within the library, I'll, I don't know if this is true today, but it probably still is. Uh, every Adventist church, church uh, library on a college or university campus has a special collections room. And we usually call it the Ellen White Room because that's usually where her writings are kept. <laughs> so, so technically it's a special collections room, but it's it's generally the room where her writings are kept, and so you can read all her writings, uh, even previous editions. Now it turned out I went to Loma Linda University. Of course, it's called La Sierra University today, but back then it was Loma Linda University. And I worked in the library. I actually worked in that room. <laughs> and oh, okay, so, wow. And so when the whole controversy was going on about Desmond Ford and and others, Walter Ray, you may have heard of him. Um, he's the one, Walter Ray is another Adventist pastor who had uh, proven that uh, Ellen White had plagiarized most of her writings from others. Mm. And so... I thought, well, this whole thing is going on right now, and I happen to be working in a very, uh, I mean, this is the most unique position for me to be in because I'm working in a spot where I can do my own research. Right. So I decided to try to resolve this for myself. And so I was able to read Ellen White's writings, 
right there, compare them with the people she allegedly copied from, because it was mm-hmm. alleged in my mind at the time. Also, to just get my Bible out or use the Bible there to compare what she was saying with what the scriptures are saying. And to my shock, because, you know, I'd grown up believing in her up to that point, you know, to mm-hmm. my shock, I was able to find out that, oh, no, uh, she really did plagiarize quite a bit. I mean, I saw too many examples where she took almost word for word from other people. Wow. And they claimed that God told her this when, in fact, it was this other doctor or this other person had written this before, and she just copied it wholesale. Now, I might have bought the argument back then that, well, she only copied the good stuff. You know, God showed her uh, the good things to copy, and that's all she took. But right. the problem I ran into was back then, you know, she's a creature of her times. Uh, there are things that health reformers made, you know, statements that or that they made or theories that they had come up with that today are clearly wrong, and she mm-hmm. copied those as well. So if God was giving her just the truth, well, how would he how would he uh, transmit error to her to give to us? So I had to come to the conclusion that she was wrong in a lot of things, and um, and especially coming to the scriptures in regards to certain doctrines like the investigative judgment or later on the state of the dead and other things, uh, there are some serious problems. And so I had to come to the conclusion that she was not the um, the, the prophetess that was taught her, you know, that, that she was. But Now, uh, what, 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 what are some of her, I guess, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, what are some of her prominent, false prophecies that you're aware of? Well, just off the top of my head, I believe there is one in 1856, I think. Mm-hmm. And that's just one. There's several others. But in essence, uh, she said an angel was you know, showing her at a particular Bible conference that they were attending. And, you know, see, you know, she often said that an angel would be with her to show her things. And so, you know, certain people in this conference, she said that some would be uh, food for worms, meaning that they would die. Others Mm. would be recipients of the seven last plagues, meaning that the Lord would be coming within her lifetime. And others, of course, would be uh, translated to heaven without seeing death. Uh, Today we might call that the rapture. But that, mm-hmm. you know, translated is the term that they used back then. So, of course, she made that comment, and uh, so many Adventists were looking for, you know, in essence, they're saying, well, if she's speaking for God, or at least she's relaying truth from God, then that means Jesus is going to come within our lifetime. And so, mm-hmm. for many, many years, people within the Adventist Church kind of kept tabs on everybody who attended that conference. And uh, and up to the last person, and eventually, you know, she died, and everybody else died, and of course, we're still here. So that is a I would call a false prophecy. And right, I think most right. reasonable people would call that a false prophecy as well. Of course, within Adventism, they have to um, find a way to explain that. So usually, they try to say it's a conditional prophecy, even though no condition was given within that prophecy. Um, I understand that she also gave, like, uh, and this is what Adventists are known for, she gave some poor health advice or something like that in in certain respects. Um, uh, It was kind of like quack medical um, um, uh, assertions that she gave. Um, uh, I I know it was uh, Adventists, is is it like they don't drink tea or something like that or coffee or is it so, yeah, uh, that's, that's certainly true. That's one yeah. of the things they share with the Mormons, actually. <laughs> yeah, the Mormons also. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I had I had two Mormon elders in my house one time, and um, they said, uh, "Well, you know, they were kind of frustrated with me, and they were like, well, are you gonna follow the commandments?'" I was like, yeah, "I'm gonna follow God's commandments as best as I can." <laughs> and then they was like. Well, do you promise that you're not going to drink tea or coffee? I said, uh, 
Well, I mean, what's the issue? Is it, is it caffeine? Or can I drink Diet Coke? <laughs> you know, <laughs> 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 you know they was like, and he was like, "Well, you guys, you could drink Coke. It's not caffeine." I was like, "Well, what's what's the deal with tea and coffee? I mean, isn't tea healthy for people?" <laughs> And uh, well, maybe I have decaf coffee if it's, if it's the issue is caffeine. <laughs> Just pulling the you know pulling the chain, but but yeah, I, I do know that they had that thing in common with the Adventists. Um, and yet, of course, we know today that certain teas, even though they may have some caffeine in it, are actually are, are healthy for you. Right. Yeah, they're very, very beneficial. Uh, so um, so was it um. The plagiarism that eventually got you questioning, and what was the last straw? What was it that uh, finally just uh, was the you know the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak? Well, would you believe it? It, it? You would think that seeing all that, I mean, the first you know the health issue, you know the the I guess the health counsel she gave, some of which was good because she copied from some good sources, right? Uh, but you know, but there were still some errors there, and I ran into those. And then, of course, on the doctrinal side, you know, there were some serious errors there. And yet, that wasn't enough for me to leave yet. It didn't take me, it took me another seven years or so to finally leave. And what finally did it was the gospel itself. Right. Uh, I didn't quite understand the gospel at the time. And I guess this is one of the reasons why I believe that the Lord really has to open the heart to, for someone to believe the gospel. Right. Uh, because if you or anybody else had met me back in the mid-80s or so to share the gospel with me, it wouldn't have registered at all. Uh, I wouldn't understand it. And because it, it, the, Advent, the Adventists strongly believe you, you have to be saved by your works. Isn't that correct? They will say no, but that is actually correct. No. And it, and a lot of it centers around uh, the um, Sabbath the Sabbath day observance. Right. Oh, also because the investigative the, judgment. Does, I mean, I would think, for, you know, it's like um, the, I, to me the investigative judgment definitely ties to work salvation, much like the Catholic purgatory teaching. You know, uh, well, I've had Catholics say, really, "Well, we believe." Hey, I've had Catholics say, "We believe we're saved by grace." And then I uh, I said, but you believe in purgatory, and purgatory denies the idea that you're saved by grace because someone has to pray you into heaven. So yeah, well, of course, the only difference is uh, in purgatory, at least you get out eventually. But with, in the Adventist scheme, you don't get out. Right. Once you're judged, you're done. You're done. Yeah. That, and then and if, you, and if you and if you happen to live in the end times, you know they have this view that. The, the final test uh, that determines whether you're a true believer or not is the day that you worship on. So, in other words, if you go to church on Sunday, you will receive the mark of the beast, as they call it, you know, the mark of the beast as in Re you know, Revelation. And, uh, of course, if you uh, keep the Sabbath day, then you will receive the, the seal of God. Mm. And um, But even then, you have to, um, at some point during this, time of trouble, as they call it, toward the end, of, you know, we might say the tribulation period, You, at some point during that time you have to not only keep the Sabbath, but you have to stand before God without the benefit of a mediator. So in other words, your life has to be virtually, it has to be sinless right. at some yeah. point you know, because Jesus will no longer be there as the mediator for you. And so and That's impossible. <laughs> it, it, exactly, it is. And uh, you can imagine the kind of Terror that you know many Adventists would have, you know, when they really contemplate that kind of teaching, and how many of them hope that they are not living in the end times. Now, so but um, it, se but seven years rate, later, it, 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 was it? Uh, how did you encounter the gospel? What was it? Was it a person that, or, or a particular book, or a, uh, evangelist that you encountered that um, shared the gospel with you? Well, what had happened was that I was on a uh, Adventist uh, Internet forum. Of course, this is back in the time when the Internet was really relatively new, at least new to us, right. email and, and things like that. Right. And I was in an Adventist 
a discussion forum, and uh, we were discussing you know various things related to Adventism, obviously. But what I noticed that, was that there was one person on there that was I would call very zealous for the Adventist faith, and I would see this person uh, all over the internet at the time, you know, mm. uh, promulgating you know Adventist doctrine, debating with other Christians as to why they should be Adventists. And then after a while, this person started changing to you know, basically upholding doctrines that were really contrary to Adventist teaching. And so I thought, well, what happened? It's almost like a, uh, you know, Paul, you know, Apostle Paul's experience. Right. Almost like that. And so I got in touch with this person kind of off, you know, away out of the forum, and I found out that, uh, you know, she was teaching – or she was uh, running to things in the scriptures that contradicted Adventist belief, and she was really uh, having a bit of a, um, I guess she had a little bit of a crisis at first, because, you know, if you are really zealous about one thing, one set of mm-hmm. beliefs, and you find contrary information, that can be very, uh, um, well, it can put a lot of stress on you, and it can be very traumatizing in some cases, but at least it will make you think, Right. Well, at any rate, what ended up happening was that she was moving towards the gospel. And in the end, it took her and, of course, uh, forwarding some of Dale Ratliff and Mark Martin's uh, materials to me. Right. Uh, it helped me to, I would put it this way, if you or anybody else at the time tried to share the gospel with me, it wouldn't have made any sense at all. However, if she did, Dale Ratliff, Mark Martin, they were able to explain the gospel to me in such a way that I could understand it, being a, right. an Adventist myself. And that's what did it. God used that to kind of open my, you know, I'd say the light bulb went off and I got it. And once I got it, it was so wonderful, I, I couldn't stay within Adventism anymore. Right. This was just too good to pass up. I mean, the idea that you're not saved by your works by the day you go to church on or trying to get through an, an investigative judgment that once a person truly comes to faith in Jesus Christ, that they have eternal life, not maybe will have, you actually have right. it. That was a wonderful thing to me, and that still is wonderful to me, that no matter what trials or challenges I go through in life, I know that Jesus will get me through and that he has eternal life for me, I mean, he has it. I, I have it as a present possession, not as something I might get in the future. Grace. It's it's called grace. It is no. so wonderful, and that's what finally did it. That's that was that was 16 years ago. Are you still in contact with um, this person? No, I've lost touch with her now. Okay. Uh, so um, I've never met Daniel Ratzlaff or Mark Martin either, though I've talked to them on the phone uh, some years ago, and right. uh, I still receive some of their, you know, their writings. You know, they they have a the former Adventist Fellowship has a um, uh, a magazine called Proclamation. Right. And I I don't know if you receive it, but I I do. And it's a great mm-hmm. magazine, and especially. Um, uh, geared towards uh, sharing the gospel to Seventh-day Adventists or those who are wanting to know more about what Adventism teaches. Right. So, um, uh, did you ever uh, did you ever marry? I don't know if you're married. Do you have children? I am married, and no, I don't have any children. Uh, was your wife, uh, did you meet her while you was an Adventist, or you met her afterward? Oh, I met, I met her afterwards. Okay, so uh, I, she, she was never an Adventist herself, was she? No. Uh, yeah, I know. Good roll on. You got to be as old as I am. I don't know. You know, maybe <laughs> even though you got a young voice, though. I tell you, you got a young voice. So I, I would, I, w- I would swear, I think that you're about, you know, in your early thirties, the way you sound. But well, you're um, very kind. I don't yeah, feel old, but I'm actually yeah. closer to. Probably closer to fifty. <laughs> yeah, I'm not fifty yeah, yet, but I mean, yeah, I'm a little older 40. than me. Yeah, I, I turned forty this week, so hit the big four zero. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's great. Um, 
And I just want I just want uh, all our listeners. I, I want to make sure that they get your website because um, I really think that you have one of the best websites on the internet as far as uh, well. First of all, on the doctrines of grace, and um, second of all, on the cults. I love your section and um, and and it, it kind of actually your section on the cults kind of reminds me a little bit of the Rick Ferron Six Screens of the Watchtower kind of you know, feel, you know, it's like poisonous, you know, doctrines of the cults and, and, but, um, uh, it, it, it's pretty cool. It's very well documented. Um, whenever I want to, whenever I speak to an Adventist or I want to research Sabbatarianism, you have great articles on there and you have articles that you have, um, there on the early church and what it taught about why, um, it was, um, honoring Jesus' um, death and resurrection on the eighth and first day of the week, which is Sunday, as opposed to the seventh day. And um, and I, I always refer your website to anyone who asks me about the Adventist. So uh, gospeloutreach.net, that's Roland's website. It's a very elaborate website. It's, it's huge. It has lots of great stuff. It has audio files as articles. So if you want to learn about Adventism or Jehovah's Witnesses or any of the other cults, even Unitarian Universalism, I mean, he has a large number of cults on his website. And um, uh, so, you know, I really strongly, strongly recommend that everyone bookmarks uh, Roland's website, keep it, because it's a, it's a definite keeper website. I have it bookmarked, uh, gospeloutreach.net. And I also wanted to share with everyone, our our listening audience, um, there's a great chart, actually, on the Worldwide Church of God's website. And they're no longer known as the Worldwide Church of God. They're called Grace Communion International. But I'm going to give you this link. And, uh, Roland, you you might want to check it out. It's uh, www.gci.org backslash about us backslash roots. And there's a great genealogical chart that links um, the Church of God, all the churches of God, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Adventists all together and where they came from, um, all the way down to uh, the Congregationalist and British Separatist churches. So it's a great chart. Um, I, uh, Barbara Anderson, who's a, a Watchtower researcher, uh and when I gave her when I when I gave her the link to this chart she loved it. Uh so they have two charts on there, one that's more geared towards the split offs within the Worldwide Church of God and their history. And then the chart right here that I just gave you the link for actually shows you the association of Adventist Churches of God and Jehovah's Witnesses as all religious cousins. So it's a it's a great uh, if you want to really Incredible see, chart. it is. It's it's fantastic, and um, so it's 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 still on their site, and they also you know have a great story. I've read Transformed by Truth by Joe Takach, um, and I saw the DVD that they have, um, which is you can see on YouTube free of charge. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's called um, uh, what's the name of their DVD? Uh, it, it evades me, but uh, I'm sure you'll see, a, you know, um, uh, some uh, uh, mention of it on their website on Grace Communion International. So, um, yeah, and, and, and they have a great story. The Worldwide Church of God, a whole cult that became Christian and, um, and uh, that went from work salvation to grace, to realizing the the, the, the idea that, we are saved because God has given us salvation as a gift, a free gift, and all we have to do is receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And uh, and, and there's uh, you know there's no works. God imputes faith into us. He gives us eyes to see and ears to hear. So uh, yeah, they, they have a great story, and um, you know Roland's story is an encouragement to us. So. I, I, I just want the callers to, to remind you that just press 1 if you want to talk to Roland or ask him any questions. 
Um, of course, one thing I'd like to mention, too, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you look at the history of all these various groups, especially the one that you see in the chart that you just mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, and you can you know, get other religious uh, groups in as well, how did this all start? Well, it all started with, you know, basically refusing or not or not obeying uh, Jesus' admonition about setting a day. Hmm. See, when it when, see when when a, a group of people, when a person or uh, a, a you know religious community decides to uh, deny the scriptures on a particular doctrine, or they may say they affirm the Bible, but what they end up really doing is taking a, a different tangent on it that actually undermines the teaching of scripture. For example, setting a date for Jesus' second coming. Mm-hmm. That error leads to other errors, the, prop, the first one, which leads to other errors that prop up the uh, previous ones. And before you know it, you have religious cult there, and it spawns other religious cults. And I think we can see that with... Uh, with Joe's Witnesses, with Seventh-day Adventism, and other uh, groups that have uh, that had risen back in the uh, 1800s, it all started with uh, not obeying God on, you know, setting a date, and then refusing to repent of that. Though I will cut William Miller some slack because he did repent of it, mm-hmm. but unfortunately the damage was done, and right. so. While it's good to be excited about Jesus coming again, and that's that's our blessed hope, we're looking for that as as believers. Uh, setting a date, of course, is a terrible error, and it, and it often you know one error leads to another. And right. so it's so important, I think, as you know Christians, that we stick to what the scriptures teach and don't go beyond that. And uh, if whatever ideas we come up with are not really taught in the Word of God. Uh, we need to, um, in essence, subordinate those ideas to what the scriptures actually teach, you know, whether we may find it palatable or not. All right. Because um, by deviating from the scriptures, we run into all kinds of problems. This is what uh, Jesus, actually, Jesus' last words of, of uh, I guess, um, advice or counsel to his apostles before he um he rose into the heavens uh was at Acts one seven he said to them it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And 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 basically he tells them, you know, don't worry about the time of my return. Uh you know that's not for you to know. Of course we should be excited about it. We do have signs that he gave us to look for but um trying to pick out to, to pick out a specific time he tells us you know it's not for us to know uh but then he goes on to say what we are to do he says you will receive power when the holy spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth and so uh the christian is supposed to be primarily occupied with sharing the gospel and um and the gospel is the good news of uh, the lord's death burial and resurrection and so um uh i think sometimes we christians become bored with the gospel it's just too uh boring i guess i i guess they, they, we're not excited enough about jesus death and his resurrection, and which is, which is the whole idea of, um, uh, of you know, Christmas and Easter. I, I think it's, it's a way to remember, and that's what Jews did. The Jews had Passover, and um, the Passover was meant to remember, remember your deliverance from Egypt, and so, a very Jewish practice, and and is to you know to remember uh, everything within Judaism is about remembering the the prayers are about remembering uh and uh i i think in that sense we could learn something from uh Judaism from from our 
our Jewish roots as a Jewish sect. And uh, the, the, the disciples said to keep their traditions. Uh, the didache, which is the Greek word, is teaching or traditions. So we should uh, remember what the apostles taught, remember what Jesus taught, remember his sacrifice, remember why he came, his advent, and looking forward to his second advent, uh, which is his second coming. And, 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 but that doesn't mean that we should go beyond what Scripture gives us, which is um, trying to set a certain date. And, uh, and, 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 it, and it, it affects people because even though, for example, Harold Camping has repented uh, he affected thousands, if not millions, of people, and there were people who sold their homes to buy yeah. placards, you know. And they don't have a house, and I guarantee you, Harold Camping did not return them any money that they lost for selling their homes foolishly. So, uh, uh, you know, all it takes is a little error. Well, there's and, even a case. There was even a case where. Uh, a woman had uh, basically willed her fortune to yeah. Harold Camping Ministry when she could have given it to her family, and yeah. uh, and of course they're not the family's not getting that money either, you know because they they um, you know said that hey we you know the family should have that money because they need it but because she the, the woman who died believed so strongly in Harold Camping she ended up loaning the money to his ministry and so her family was. Uh, left um, without any aid there. Right. Uh, the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so, uh, you know, what seems like just a little bit of error, it can go a long way. And so, you know, false prophecy is a very, very serious error. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22, uh, God says that the prophet who presumes to speak in my name and it, it does not come to pass do not listen to them. And I believe in verse 22, uh, God spells out a death sentence for false prophecy. So um, uh, just think about it. You know, false prophecy, it, it's, it's, not, it's not worth uh, for teachers to, to, to claim a certain prophecy at a certain date for Jesus' coming, especially when we've been warned so much. We've been warned by the Messiah, Jesus said that there will be false Christs and false prophets. Uh, and he warns us that it's not for us to know the times. And the, uh, Paul also warns us not to worry about endless genealogies and, and, and old wives' tales. Um, so uh, the simplicity of the gospel, uh, the converting of the nations to, to recognizing the Messiah has come, and is going to return to establish his kingdom. Those are the more important things. Uh, um, hey, uh, uh, Gus. Yeah. Yeah, this is Dale again. Uh, Roland. Yeah, I've, I've been listening to the the uh, whole thing, and I think you guys have been, you know, you commended. I think you guys are doing a great job. And um, I haven't spoken through the whole thing. I've been making French toast while I've been listening. So, um, but. Uh, uh, it is interesting to see the different parallels you know, between witnesses. You know, so I was born into the witnesses. Um, I was baptized back in '82 and disfellowshipped uh, September of uh, 2010 uh, for apostasy. But there are so many parallels with so many of the religions which you guys are bringing out. You know, right. people start to believe in what a person said rather than what the gospel says. Right. And you know, when when people start to do that, they're putting their their faith, they're actually uh, giving worship to uh, someone else's teaching rather than the Bible. That's what happens with the 1914. You know, right. the witnesses will not allow that to be uh, checked with Scripture. And yet, you know, like for instance, Second uh, Corinthians uh, 13, 5 and 6, very simply admonishes all Christians on an individual level to check their doctrine to make sure that the worship is not disapproved in Christ somehow. Right. So you know it, it you know it, but 
You know, some of these religions, like the first century Pharisees, you know, they're just out to protect their own religious establishment because, you know, they right. face the fact. I mean, they're, they they get money for it. They're paid. It's their livelihood, you know, sad right. day. But I I just wanted to throw in a couple thoughts there. But I think yeah, that's great. Kind of great. Absolutely. Amen. That certainly yeah. is a strong incentive because if you're making your living by teaching certain doctrines or adhering to a particular uh, founder or leader of your religion, then uh, when the when you run into any um, teachings in the Bible that contradict the leader or the church establishment, uh, you have a choice to make. And unfortunately, uh, many make the choice to just be quiet and go along because they want to maintain their position. It reminds me of, um, you know, what you know was in the New Testament mentioned. There's a, uh, I'll have to look up the reference, but I think it's in the Gospel of John. But the, there was a reference made to there are many uh, you know, of the Jews who believed in in Jesus. They believed that he was the Messiah, but they didn't want to affirm him because uh, they were afraid of being cast out of the synagogue. And because they preferred the, um, you know, the approval of men or the praises of men over uh, being approved by God, and we run into that uh, today as well. You know, if you're in one of these uh, various religious uh, communities or groups here, and you run into, uh, you know, the scriptures that that contradict some of the main teachings of the group you're in, what do you do? Do you uh, put that aside and stick, stay with what's most comfortable, namely family, friends, position, and so forth, or do you, you know, have faith in God and, and follow what he says in his word and come what may? Amen. Yeah. So, um, uh, I don't see, uh, we, we have some calls in queue. Uh, I guess nobody wants to come on the air, but, um, so, Roland, I just want I want to thank you for coming on on the show today and um, sharing your story and um, and uh, we're going to continue this Adventist role next week. Uh, just uh, to let everyone know, um, uh, next week we're going to have a special time because uh, uh, we're going to have Elmer Weeb, who is the author of a book called "Who Is the Adventist Jesus," and. Um, um, it will, we're going to air next week at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, 12 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Mountain, and 10 o'clock Pacific. Uh, Elmer is you know, in the Pacific time zone, so we have to do a later broadcast. But he's author of Who is the Adventist? Jesus. Never been an Adventist, but I have his book. And we're going to talk a little bit about the similarities in the witnesses and the Adventist view of who is Jesus. And um and Elmer uh will share a little bit about that. Uh what is semi Arianism? And um and we're gonna discuss that. So uh next week at December seventeenth, Saturday, one o'clock Eastern time, twelve o'clock central, eleven o'clock mountain and ten o'clock Pacific. And we look forward to having you on the air and 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 uh listen and those who are listeners uh to learn a little more about the Adventist roots. Um maybe we might also dip into soul sleep. We we could have actually uh, touched that today, but uh I'm I'm hopefully we'll get Dale Ratsliff also and we'll talk about um the Adventist issue with um worshiping on Saturday rather than Sunday. Uh, and well, I, I, th- the- I want to thank you, Roland, for coming on there. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, I appreciate you uh, having me on. I, um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and uh, and to your audience. Yeah. Oh, well, by, we'll, we'll... by the way, uh, the soul sleep doctrine, yeah, you're right. We could have talked about that a little bit, but that will yeah. be for the future program. But that doctrine had come up as a outgrowth. It was a, that doctrine was developed to support the investigative judgment doctrine. Wow. So that's something you may, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but that's, no, no, that's where because ultimately if, if the investigative judgment is true 
and God is, you know, is going through the books in heaven, you can't have believers, you know, dying previously to 1844 and going to heaven, and then if, you know, their name comes up in the book and they were not really worthy of eternal life, you'd have God casting people out of heaven. Uh, so, so that's why they developed soul sleep. The soul sleep, yeah. But you see, again, uh, you know, this is where day setting led to investigative judgment, led to soul sleep, leads to other things, incomplete atonement. You know, one, it's so important that uh, we just not get drawn away into uh, false doctrine. It's it's so important because it leads. It's false doctrine, like it says, like leaven. It, it just grows bigger and bigger, and it affects the whole lump. Yeah, it's, it's a domino effect. One one thing leads to another. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I want to thank uh, Dale for filling in for um, for his brother Nate today. Thanks, Dale, for um, for coming on the air with us today. I, I didn't do a whole lot, but I, it's been uh, my pleasure. Yeah, and um, and I also want to thank Roland. And I uh, want to remind our audience, uh, you know, go check out his website, gospeloutreach.net. Uh, it's a great website. And, and check out uh, the Worldwide Church of God's new website, Grace Communion International. You, you can Google either either one, and I'm sure it'll come up. Um, there's still a lot of splinters out there that, that are disappointed with the main body of the leadership at the Worldwide Church of God. And I know there's... Um, a Philadelphia Church of God that still follows Herbert Armstrong's um, old teachings, um, and so uh, you know maybe maybe uh, I'll, I'll get a, a WWCG person up on here one day. You know, I'll, maybe I'll get Joe Takach. You know, give him a ring. <laughs> so I'm trying to get people on here. Uh, we have uh, so we have Elmer Weave next week at a special time of one o'clock Eastern time. And um, we have on this. I, I, I don't think we're going to have a broadcast um, uh, Christmas Eve, but we'll have uh, two broadcasts in a row with Carl and Gail Mickens, former Jehovah's Witnesses, December 31st and January 7th. And so we we, we have a lot of uh, of guests to look forward to uh, going into next year. And um, thank you for listening with uh, Healing XJWS. And don't forget to pray for Jehovah's Witnesses and to pray for Adventists. You all have a great day. Thank you.